Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's really just a delight uh, to see you all here and to have everybody come together in this gorgeous place to remember my father, Billy Abraham. This is actually, you know, his picture here. This was taken in the last year of his life in one of his favorite places uh, in Jerusalem. Um, for those of, the, of you that really didn't know him too well, um, he was a Methodist minister. He was originally from Northern Ireland, um, a longtime professor and philosopher and theologian. He spent the bulk of his career here in Dallas at Southern Methodist University uh, teaching at Perkins. And uh, basically, he was a man that spent his entire life committed to ministry and Christian scholarship. Uh, so since he passed away two years ago, you know, my brother and I, we have just been inundated with messages from so many people. We have received an outpouring of love uh, from people that, some of them strangers, that ha have just wanted to tell us how much our Father meant to them. Um, some of these people maybe had just read one of his books or heard him lecture at a conference. Um, there are many people that miss his intellectual curiosity, somebody to have a uh, argument with. Um, and there are some, you know, that really talk to us a lot about how he had this really special ability. And um, that was that even if he held a really passionate, strong belief, um, he was still able to sit down across the table from people that might have been completely opposed but the dialogue was always kind and respectful. And not only was he able to achieve this, but he modeled this behavior for other people. Um, and then we, we've heard from other people, they just love him, loved him, they miss him, and they just really appreciated his large and cheerful personality. Um, I would like to thank Michael Boyd and Todd Van Helms. So these are two of my father's uh, many former students. They organized this event, and also to Dr. Smith, who's traveled here all the way from Durham, North Carolina. So looking around this Museum of Art, it's really just a showcase of um, gorgeous Christian and Jewish art. And so much of the beauty here uh, has really been inspired by people's faith. Um, it's a really fitting space for us to stop and reflect here this evening a reminder of our rich past and our rich Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo history, so much so that just shapes our Western culture. Now these artists here, they look to their faith for inspiration, and in turn, they inspire us. My father, I believe, also was an artist of a similar kind, but of course he had a different medium, and that was of words and speech. Um, but he was guided by his faith. This was the center of his life. And he drew from the same rich biblical history in his intellectual endeavors. He was a prolific scholar, speaker, and teacher. He read constantly and widely across many subjects, including psychology, history, politics, and world religions. After retiring as an emeritus professor from Perkins, he became the founding director of the House of Wesley Studies down at uh, Truett Seminary in Baylor. He also was a senior fellow at King's College in New York and a scholar in residence at Dallas Baptist University. He was not the type of man that was to slow down. Through all these years of his life's work, he was able to balance his academic and pastoral care work. He taught two Sunday school classes at Highland Park United Methodist for over 30 years. And he was also very passionate and involved about his missionary work, most recently in Costa Rica and Romania. This teaching, mentoring, and advising brought him so much joy. Consequently, he has trained a generation of Christian ministers, scholars, and inspired and helped so many people deepen their own faith and sharpen their intellectual skills. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Todd von Helms, who knew my father well. He, he studied he, with him at Perkins and then later worked with him on various projects at Dallas Baptist University and King's College. Dr. von Helms is an ordained minister. He's got numerous, numerous degrees. 
decades of experience, he's worked with churches and teams, college students and clergy, and multiple academic, ministerial, and denominational settings. He's currently a presidential scholar of Christianity and culture at Dallas Baptist University. He's a well-known Christian author and speaker who frequently travels to lecture at different colleges across the US. So please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you so much, Siobhan, for those kind remarks. And, um, and Sean, your remarks yesterday were just so heartfelt and, and amazing. Thank you for that yesterday. And, Many of you were there as well yesterday as we, as we honored Billy. And um, I'm just curious how many of you, he was, Billy was a mentor to you in one way or another, or a teacher in your life. I mean, almost everyone here. You know, as iron sharpens iron, so one person does another. And he, he definitely sharpened me. When I was praying about doctoral studies, I had read most of his work, um, hoped to meet him one day, and I reached out and he didn't know me from anyone. And he said, sure, I'll meet you at La Madeline. <laughs> you know, his home away from home. And, and he told me, he said, I'm really busy this day. I've got maybe 30 to 45 minutes. And so I showed up and literally almost two hours later, he had convinced me that he said, yeah, you're coming to Perkins. I'm gonna be your doctoral advisor. And you know, it's really interesting. Something else came up in that conversation. And I think he borrowed this from the great baseball manager, Sparky Anderson. But he said, my, my, one of my roles, many roles, as a mentor, as an advisor, as he says, I need to find out one of two things that you need each day and then give it to you. One is a pat on the back or a kick in the pants. And you know, I kind of laughed and then years passed and it's time to submit the dissertation. It was due uh, the following weekend and it got to Friday and I realized this isn't, this isn't going to work out. And I told my wife, I just can't get it done and we're going to have to delay you know, the defense and everything by at least a semester, maybe a year. So I called and he listened patiently and he wasn't saying anything. And I kind of finished my monologue and he said, I'll have none of that. He said, he said, you'll turn it in Monday. Have a good weekend. <laughs> and he literally meant it. And guess what? I stayed up literally for almost, you know, 48 hours and I got it done. And because he knew what I needed and he was one that, you know, just with the rest of you. He didn't tell you, you know, what you necessarily wanted to hear, but it was what you needed to hear so you could be your absolute best for the Lord, for his, for his glory. And um, he had been to, to our house multiple times and would stay with us. And the first time, I, my oldest son at the time, his name's Hunter, he was probably 14. And he had met Billy in passing, but never a real conversation. And so Billy had come to, to Raleigh. And we did that, we had a packed literally performing arts center with people of all walks of life to hear him speak about the new atheism. And uh, I mean, you could hear a pin drop and it was scheduled for an hour and a half and two hours into it, nobody had left. And he could just hold that audience spellbound. You know, part of it was the accent, I think, but you know, <laughs> but you know what I mean. And we came home and it was late. We, we had something to eat and we got home and uh, Hunter, my son is sitting on the couch waiting on us. And my wife, was, wife had already gone to bed and youngest was already in bed and she told he said mom said I could stay up and so here he is he's just beaming and it's you know the Billy Abraham and he's heard me talk about him so much and, and so of course Billy sits down beside him and he says hey young man and starts speaking with him and he said are you like Billy Graham and he said no wrong Billy <laughs> he said but we serve the same God and, um, and so we talked for a while, and in that conversation, my wife at the time was dealing with, with some breast cancer issues, and Billy knew it. We had talked about it over dinner, and he said to me, he said, well, you know, and he said to my son there, he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be praying for you all fervently. And then he said, you know, and I must retire. I'm so tired. It was about 11 o'clock, and so I'm sitting there with Hunter, and we're just talking, and again, he's beaming, and we're talking about Billy and everything, and Hunter goes up, and Billy goes upstairs, and he's in the room ab above us, and it's now like midnight, and I'm like, who in the world is he talking to? Because you can hear this, the accent and the voice, and I'm like, what is he doing? And so Hunter goes up the stairs, he comes back down, and he said, Dad, he's praying, and he's praying for us, and he said, I want to pray like that. And that was Billy. I mean, the mind of the most brilliant scholar 
and the biggest heart of any pastor I've known. And they should go together, right? And one thing we'll hear tonight from J. Warren Smith is how do we love God with our mind? When you look at Mark 12, 30, it says we're to love the Lord with all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength. And unfortunately, as Christians, we neglect that. And then the subsequent verses, and then we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, I think the reality is the reason why Billy could love each of us so well is because he loved God supremely with his mind. And so our speaker today is J. Warren Smith, who is a dear friend. He's a, he's a brother. He is a favorite of every student who's been to Duke Divinity School, as well as the faculty. And um, he has numerous degrees. He went to Emory for his undergrad. He has several graduate degrees from Yale, including his PhD. He is an expert in patristics. He writes on them as well as ethics and spiritual formation. Uh, if you're going to buy one of his books, they're all good, but I would recommend the one on the Lord's Prayer. It is superb. It is so, so well done. And we've had some journeys together and spoken in different contexts and everything. And so as, as I was talking with David Watson, who's here as a student, and then Michael Boyd, and then this was about a year ago, and then with Siobhan and Sean over dinner, we just said, you know, we need to do this once a year. And we just need to remember and honor Billy and be inspired to keep pressing on and to, build, to burn that candle at both ends as he did, to have a pen in a hand at all times or a book with us, you know. And uh, as I get lazy or I'm tired or whatever, I just, I think about him every day and it just motivates me to, to keep, keep writing to keep praying, to keep serving, and to pressing on. So, um, Warren, we're so glad that you're here. Um, he's married to Kim. His uh, son Thomas and daughter Catherine are in North Carolina, so he made the voyage here to be with us tonight. So without further ado, Dr. Warren Smith. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Let me begin by saying how good it is to be with you folks. It's good to be here in Dallas. I, I didn't realize that Dallas had moved to the East Coast, uh, but this seems to happen in the mind of the NCAA. Um, it is a strange world we live in, isn't it? But most of all, I want to say thanks to Siobhan and Sean for making this possible. I cannot think of a better way to honor the legacy of your father than to create space for us to come together and ask the question, what does it mean to love the Lord your God with your mind? And to look to his example as one that we can follow. So thank you for doing that. And to Todd for uh, inviting me to be a part of this, to reflect on my relationship with Billy and what Billy has meant to all those of us who are, um, who are in the evangelical tradition, the Wesleyan tradition, uh, and who are committed and concerned not only about where the world is now, but also how the church can and needs to respond to the needs of the world. So thank you for inviting me. Could we begin with a word of prayer? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your servant, Billy Abraham. We thank you for all the talents you gave him and the way in which your grace continued to work in his life as he cultivated those talents and used them for the edification of your church. God, may we be reminded of the communion of saints, that when we gather as your body, the body in heaven and the body on earth is still united in Christ and that we remain united with him. And may his life continue to be an example, both to imitate and the source of hope as we persevere. Hear this prayer we offer in Christ's name. Todd asked me to begin by saying something about my relationship with Billy. And one of the things that is humbling about speaking to you is that I know that many of you knew Billy better than I did. Our friendship went back about 20 years ago, and it was at a gathering of John Wesley Fellows. And if you don't know what those are, you're probably just as well. No, they're very they're dear friends. They are Methodists who, through the work of Texas evangelist Ed Robb Jr., 
and Albert Outler created a reform movement within Methodism that sought to reform seminaries by providing funding for doctoral research for evangelicals. And the amazing thing is just how much uh, that organization has peppered seminaries around the country and around the world. Um, and we always have an annual meeting called Christmas Conference. And this was, as I said, about 20 years ago. And of course, Billy was, a, was a, an unavoidable presence at this conference. But what I remember specifically was uh, that he, with his Asbury connection, and Ben Witherington, the great New Testament scholar from Asbury, burned the midnight oil discussing the epistemological issue of just how far could you take the phrase word of God to describe scripture. And if you know these two people, this is a conversation that makes perfect sense and not always sense to many other people, but they clearly were engaged and people were listening to them. Um, Billy was a remarkable fellow and it was always a pleasure for me when our paths would cross in subsequent years. I have one more of my favorite story of Billy Abraham that I'm going to save for the end of my remarks. But I want to enter into the conversation that uh, Todd asked me to kick off, namely a conversation about what is the value of a Christian scholar, both in the academy, but also in the church, and then the way in which the Christian scholar can touch the world. I want to begin reflecting about that topic with an eye to Billy by pointing to a vignette contained in C.S. Lewis's ma masterful work of ironic prose, The Screwtape Letters. And in The Screwtape Letters, it is, of course, a correspondence between a senior devil, Screwtape, writing to his nephew, a junior devil, about how to seduce and ensnare the souls of human beings, preparing them for uh, their father below. And in the very first letter, Screwtape expresses concern that his nephew Wormwood is too confident in, quote, that argument is the best way to keep your patient out of the clutches of God. And then Screwtape says this, Your man has been accustomed ever since he was a boy to having a dozen incompatible philosophies dancing together inside his head. He doesn't think of doctrines primarily as true or false, but as academic or practical, worn out or contemporary conventional or ruthless. Jargon, not argument, is your best ally in keeping him from the church. Don't waste time trying to make him uh, think that materialism is true. Make him think it is strong and stark or courageous. That is the sort of thing he cares about. And then Screwtape puts his finger directly on the mistake that uh, Wormwood made. The problem with argument is that it is actually moving onto the enemy's ground. Let me say that again. The problem with argument is that it is actually moving onto the enemy's ground. Now, that is Billy Abraham in a nutshell. You see, Billy loved an argument. I mean, Billy loved that intellectual engagement, and I can still see in my mind's eye his eyes gleaming and his eyebrows veritably dancing as his argument moved to the denouement. I mean, that was Billy. But Billy didn't love argument just for argument's sake, as a mental activity, like doing a crossword puzzle. Billy loved argument because he believed that argument was a tool that God gave to Christians as a way of proving or moving people toward the truth. It was the conviction that he had in the power of human reason that if grounded in proper first principles and then following the rules of logic, one could move to a deeper knowledge of the truth the truth with a capital T, 
that we know of as the God of Israel and the God who reveals himself in his son Jesus Christ in the light of his Holy Spirit, right? But what's amazing is the way in which, therefore, Billy recognized that philosophical arguments, in fact, were ways by which the church reached the world. And what the church needed was to use arguments to counter the world's critiques, which really weren't serious critiques, but just use of jargon to attack the church. And that, of course, is one of his critiques of the so-called new atheists, who aren't saying, in fact, anything new at all. Right? But one place you see the way in which he brought together the idea of argument for the service of the kingdom was in his understanding of the relationship between theology and evangelism. In his book, The Logic of Evangelism, which I'm told by the folks at Erdman's was his you know, most widely bought book uh, of all the books that he wrote. And what he does there is bring together two fields of study and activity which very often, sadly, in seminaries get divided. I mean, the place where I teach has four areas, okay? Bible, history, theology, and then that catch-all area called ministerial division, which includes evangelism. But the problem by dividing it that way is very often evangelism does not have a theological grounding, and theology doesn't have a practical grounding. What Billy sought to do in that book was to bring the two together, right? And therefore, he was saying, we need to understand how evangelism works in a world that is characterized by the spread of globalism, and with it, cultural pluralism. Now, one place, I think, that's one of the things that's beautiful about Billy was he wasn't just someone who theorized about evangelism, he was a practitioner as well. And many of you know the stories of how he worked both in Costa Rica and then ultimately planting Methodist churches in Romania. And I've heard him give the story twice of how he found the man who would be his partner working in Romania, a fellow who had been a member of a satanic rock group called 666, and how this fellow was converted by Pentecostals in Costa Rica. But Billy brought him into the Methodist fold, and I've heard him tell it one of two ways. One is that he proclaimed John Wesley's idea of justifying and sanctifying grace, and how those two go together to build up the individual and the church. But then also, Billy introduced him to Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God. And the argument basically is that God is that greater than which we can imagine. And therefore, if we recognize that a cause is always greater than the effect, then God must exist to be the cause of that idea of God that exists within us, right? Now, I've heard philosophers say that they are sure Anselm proved something. They're not sure it's the existence of God, right? But Billy saw in this very sophisticated philosophical argument that Anselm was pointing to the truth and reality of God's existence. And therefore, that argument can be used as a wedge to drive open the door of the closed mind to the possibility of the reality of God's existence. And then when you open that, create that crack to open the door, then the spirit can begin to work to infuse the, the, the skeptic with faith. And therefore, evangelism is not separate from philosophical proof, but the two are in service to each other. All right? Now, the last thing I'll say about Billy is the way in which he dealt with a serious divide that exists within theology and which is within Methodism specifically, the divide between tradition and emotion, or what we call experience. 
I heard an interview that Billy did in which he asked the question, in which he was asked, so where did Methodism fall off the rails? Where did it go wrong? And the person said, well, was it back in the early 20th century when uh, the social gospel movement was born? Billy said, no, it goes back to the 19th century when people became influenced by a German philosopher by the name of Friedrich Schleiermacher. And Schleiermacher said, the essence of religion is the immediate feeling of absolute dependence on God. All right, now that sounds pretty good, and you can see why it would appeal to a Methodist. After all, John Wesley's warming heart experience could be interpreted as an immediate feeling of his absolute dependence upon God's grace for the forgiveness of his sins, right? So it would seem to fit. The problem was that Schleiermacher's definition of religion was reductionistic. It all boiled down to feelings, how you felt, and therefore anything that wasn't directly related to your feelings was marginalized and put on the periphery. Therefore, when Schleiermacher wrote his great theological treatise, his systematic theology, he relegated to the last handful of pages, and that's not hyperbole, the doctrine of the Trinity and eschatology, the hope of the resurrection. Because he said, look, you can't have an immediate feeling of triune God or of the end times, right? So he sort of dismissed those. But what Billy's insight was that all Christian experience is not a private experience. It's personal but not private because that experience is the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. What Paul describes in Romans 8 when he says, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is God's Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And then Billy went on to say, therefore, every Christian experience is an experience of the Trinity, the witness of the Spirit to the love of the Father manifest in the Son. Therefore, Billy said, you can't separate experience from theology. You've got to have the Trinity, because it is the Trinity that is revealed in our experiences. And so one of the things that Billy was so committed to was saying, we've got to interpret our feelings not in a subjective way, such that I can say, well, it's my feelings and you can't discredit them but that we hold each other accountable. Some feelings are from a true Holy Spirit, and some are from a demonic spirit. And so Billy said, we need to interpret our feelings and our experience of God in light of the witness of Scripture and the teachings of the church, especially articulated in what he called the canonical theism, which has the Confessions of the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed at their center. Right. So that's how Billy worked as a theologian. But here's the last story I'll end with. Years ago, one of my best friends from graduate school was interviewing for a teaching position at Perkins School of Theology. And I mean, these are rigorous. You're not only you know, interviewing everybody and his brother, but you're also expected to present a, an intelligent, coherent lecture to faculty and students that reflects both your ability to communicate well and your, the loftiness of your scholarship. Well, when my friend came to Perkins to, to interview and to present, she became deathly ill. I mean, she wasn't actually on death's door, she just felt like it. I mean, she was deeply sick. She couldn't keep anything down. And so here she was, going before the faculty who would vote on whether or not she would join them, and she was wretched. Billy took her aside, took her into his office, and Billy laid hands on her and prayed for her because he believed in the healing and strengthening power of the Spirit, the parakletos, the sustainer, to give her the strength 
to get through the lecture and come out the other end. And she did. Well, long enough then to dash off and you know, take care of herself before coming back for Q&A. But that's Billy. How many seminaries would you find a professor who wants to lay hands for healing because he believes in the healing power of the Spirit? I mean, that's Billy who could follow and explain Anselm, but who also knew how to touch people or be a vehicle by which the Spirit touched people. And that's the sort of balance of heart and mind that he embodied and that hopefully we can imitate. Thank you.